We love our gadgets. We're addicted to them. We obsess over them. We compare them. We update them constantly. I love my new iPhone 4S because it has a great camera, among other things. Today, we're nothing if not mobile, as the Horizon report told us a long time ago. Uh, we want to dip into the digital world everywhere and always. Uh, we share pieces of our lives. We are able to move back and forth in space and time. If we get divorced from our devices, we may become nervous, anxious, and irritable. Perhaps we might need to think about a 12-step program. Um, more and more, the combined impact of inexpensive digital technology and a faster wireless network have collapsed space, undercutting distance and confounding time. The digital space is everywhere and therefore nowhere in particular. It's both a place in and of itself and also profoundly placeless in traditional terms. Um, I'm curious, what impact does this have on our, our museums? But I don't precisely know. Certainly there are benefits to the everywhereness of the digital world. Um, I can speak with my, my mother, my father, my, my cousins, uh, my sister uh, across time and space. We can connect easily uh, with hundreds, if not thousands of friends. Uh, we can share information about our lives in a way that we never could before. This has changed ideas about privacy, about the nature of our work, about the nature of our lives. Uh, we can talk to anyone, um, anywhere, send our thoughts out, get their thoughts back if we'd like. And all of this is really changing how we think about the nature of human identity uh, and human education and really everything around us. It's a ubiquitous world that affects us constantly. When I think about the internet over the last 20 years or so and going back to the mid-1990s, um, it's clear that there's been a merging of the, and a blurring of the nonprofit space, the education space, and all those spaces. And, and where has that really taken us? Uh, more and more, it all begins to look somewhat similar as we strive to put more information forward. Um, also, the digital space and a lot of the interface design comes to look more like uh, the commercial mall, the shopping district, and a lot of that. And I, I think that's not a, not a great thing. Um, in, increasingly, if, if unsurprisingly, um, a, a lot of it is about branding and about selling. And that's true in the education world and it's true in the museum world. And I, I think it's the world we live in. Uh, I just think it's something we contend with. But I do have a kind of, of uh, nostalgia for the days, of the early days of the internet when we didn't know what interface design was supposed to look like and not all websites look quite as similar as they do today. Um, there was more experimentation at that point. And I would love to see us get back to that kind of experimentation, teach it. In, in higher education, in schools, and reflected in museums. The museum space, on the other hand, is a very, very specific space. Specific design, specific materials, highly individualized. Museums don't tend to look like the rest of the world that's around them. They're very unique in that way, and, and I think also arguably very, very privileged. But what can we learn from, from that? Um, they're very beautiful spaces. They contain objects which are unique, which surprise us, which generally speaking exist only in one place. And they foster intense, particular, irreplaceable experiences, flashes of recognition and flashes of surprise, things like we've never seen and things that we have seen but we see in new contexts, such as a sculpture made out of recycled water bottles by Nigerian artist um, Bright Ugochukwu Eke on view at the Tang Museum recently. Our experience of art is always also, in some sense, social. Uh, we go to museums with people. We look at works of art individually, but we look at them thinking about who made them, who else is looking at them, and what they mean. The museum space is an educational space as well. It's a space where we go to learn, but a kind of learning takes place that's nonlinear very, very hard to pin down, very hard to realize even when it's happened to the person that it's, that it's happened to. We're trying to learn more about that learning all the time, but, but it's very complex. The same kind of complexity that we've talked about in, in other respects the last two days. We look at artwork 
in our bodies, with our bodies. We move with our bodies when we look at artworks. And I can guarantee you that he's going to remember this sculpture better than he would if he saw it without using his body, if he saw it only on a screen, if he didn't know how big it really was by standing next to it. Uh, the museum space can often be a very crowded space. As Marcia Semmel mentioned, there are over 17,000 museums in the United States today, and they're often surprisingly popular. Uh, it's very common to wait in line for a major show at a major museum. So the idea that we don't care about museums and art and the objects that are in there, history and science, is, is kind of, um, doesn't line up with the facts. There's a lot of people there. We also get tired in museums. There's something called museum fatigue, and um, we sit down. Um, we want now to bring our gadgets to the museum. We want to bring our computers. Uh, as I said at the beginning, it's mobile today. But we might ask ourselves, who's having more fun here? <laughs> we want to photograph what we see in museums. Sometimes we don't even look at the object. We look at our camera, we photograph it, and, and we move on. That's become an increasing problem in the last couple of years. We are photographically addicted, including me. We're, we're photographing everything. We want to have a personal relationship with the art that's there. We want to show that we saw it. But at times, that can really get in the way of seeing it and, and make it a, a kind of terrifying experience. Um, over the last few years, and to wrap up here, there's been a lot of good work over the last 20 years in museums, a lot of great work in technology. I think we've been really good uh, using the web, creating kiosk programs. We've been creating curriculum, curricula, teacher materials. There's terrific videos of artists and others in places like Art, Art Babel. We've provided a ton of information. I think the jury's still out on social networking. Um, are museums people? And if not, how should that affect our use of social media? Uh, in the end, it's all about looking at the art objects and how can we empower that. Looking forward, I think that museums need to think about the role of mobile small screen devices. What can we do with them? What are they good for? How do they fit into the ecology? Can we keep up with the pace of change of them? What about bringing your own devices? What sort of pressures does that put on us? Is there any other way we can go? How much technology and information is enough to get the job done, and how much is more than we really need? Let's err on the side of a little less, maybe, rather than a little bit more. Can we look more critically at the visual nature of the spaces we're building online and expect as much of them as we expect as our bricks and mortar architecture, galleries, exhibitions, and artworks? Can we make online spaces that are simpler but more compelling? Online experiences that don't try to do everything but succeed in doing one or two things very well. Can we create virtual spaces and experiences that will entice and empower our users to click more slowly, maybe even less often, but linger longer and get more out of the times they spend with us in real space, in museum space? Thank you.